What's up, Salt Strong Nation? Joe Simons, like diamonds, back again, special edition podcast. My boy Brian, one of our insider members, introduced me to Dennis. Dennis is the founder and the guy behind the YouTube channel, Second Chance Tackle, where Dennis every week is putting out really awesome videos all about real repair. Every type of fishing reel you can imagine, this guy knows how to take apart, fix, and repair. He talks about all the major like mistakes people make when they're trying to take apart their reel, everything you possibly need to know about reel repair, and some of the most common failure points. So I connected with Dennis and I said, hey, it'd be really fun if you kind of put like together like a four-part video series on some of the things that you're looking for on some of the most common types of reels that you get into your shop. And he agreed. And he did four really, really amazing videos. And then afterwards, after you guys get to see this and give us some questions down below, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on a podcast, it's saltstorm.com. Go in there and find the actual tip and leave us some comments down below on any kind of questions you have. If it's certain types of brands, if it's certain types of reels, if it's anything you could possibly imagine with real repair, we want to hear about it. And then we will go out and film a live podcast with Dennis and myself answering all those questions and probably pick apart uh, one reel there why we record the webinar. So here is Dennis, Second Chance Tackle. If you haven't followed him on YouTube, it is a must. The guy is amazing. You can learn so much about every type of reel possible. So this is going to be in four different segments. You'll kind of hear the end of one and the next one will start. So guys, thank you so much for all the love, all the support. Check out my main man, Dennis, there at Second Chance Tackle on YouTube. And once again, leave some questions because that's what we're going to base the second version where I get Dennis on here live to do another podcast. Enjoy. Hi, this is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle. And today we're, uh, we're actually doing a couple of different parts of a series that looks at fishing reel types and common failure points. And I'm starting out with one of the oldest uh, types, which is simply a, um, a conventional reel by today's standards. It was probably called a, a boat reel at the time. And fishing reels, when they first got going in the 1800s, were very simple pieces. As a matter of fact, a lot of them, uh, this is probably the oldest reel I have, a lot of them were simply made of wood. And that's what uh, this one is. And this one was called the center pin reel because it has one pin for the center. It has a, a single piece spool with the handles mounted right to the spool. And you simply gathered your, your uh, line by turning the spool while this is anchored on a piece of brass on the other side of a, of a piece of wood that's been machined. Right? So when ma modern manufacturing came along, this one is a, uh, a reel that was made a hundred years ago. This is a mysel back tripod. And uh, I, ch I chose this one because the factory wasn't far from where I live in Newark, New Jersey. And that's what it's stamped on the bottom here. It's stamped uh, mysel back uh, brothers, Newark, New Jersey. Well, we know they moved the manufacturing of this reel to Ohio after 1922. So that's, uh, that's why I say this reel is a hundred years old. But conventional reels in this form and fashion uh, are very simple reels. A big gear drives a little gear, like this. A big gear drives a little gear. The little gear spins the, the spool, and uh, the spool gathers the line. In its simplest form, there are no other attachments. This one is actually called a tripart. Uh, I haven't figured out what the three parts are. I think there's more than three, but uh, simply if you take the side plate off, this one unscrews, with a little uh, bezel kind of a thing here. You can remove the side plate and you'll see here's your big gear and the little gear is actually attached to the spool right here. I think it, come, it may come off but the little gear and the big gear intersect held in by a frame and uh, drive the reel. Pretty, pretty simple engineering and simple sometimes is best in design. So that over a hundred years ago was a pretty interesting accomplishment and they evolved over time. So here's an example of a 1950s reel. It added the star drag. The star drag was actually introduced by uh, Edward von Hoff uh, in the early 1900s. But this is an Ocean City reel that uh, was made in the 1950s. 
and you had a star drag and you have a bigger handle and you have more capacity and you have modern uh, plastic or Bakelite or uh, any of those uh, kind of uh, compounded plastic type products uh, as the side plates as opposed to brass or German silver uh, and very adequate and can go fishing today kind of a thing. Still, big, big reel gear, drives little gear, drives the spool, collect the, uh, the line. It doesn't matter what size. Here's, here's a pen uh, mariner, pen 49, huge reel, right? They even get bigger with the senators with the 12 and the 4 O's. Uh, this one adds an ability to override your, your, uh, your anti-reverse, but the same idea. And then uh, we'll stop with this one, the Jig Master, and we'll explain some of the things that go, uh, go right or go wrong. But the same idea here. Now, I took the Jig Master because we're trying to limit these uh, conversations about what fails to about five minutes for each reel type. And the Jig Master makes that easy because it has a single screw take apart system. So you simply unscrew and then quick turn of the reel and you have the Jig Master. So what goes wrong with relatively simple design reels, big gear driving little gear, uh, other than um, uh, obvious damage, right? So these reels can break the side plates. You can get frame twist if it, if it bangs. You can get bent spools and you can get broken handles. That's obvious damage. But what goes wrong in the operation of these reels? And this is the pen jig master looking at it from the inside. You have a bridge plate. This is what it would look like on the other side. We have a bridge plate, a big gear, uh, and we have a series of drag washers inside that gear. And what really goes wrong with these is the consumable pieces and parts. It's very rare that um, uh, the metallic works, the gearing, and the like uh, break. But in, in a typical uh, reel, especially one with age that's used a lot, this spring is going to break. That's called the eccentric spring. And you'll notice it rocks back and forth. And any of, the, any of you out there that have had the opportunity to work with a metal hanger and know that if you, you rock it enough times, you can break it, well, that's the same thing that happens with that. The other consumable in this is actually the drag washers. And the drag washers are there to give you some flexibility in the uh, uh, handling of a fish. In some cases, the manufacturer built that in with the ability to backpedal the reel, which is very similar to the old reel, so that you could fight by hand and not wear the drags. But most of the modern day reels do not have that override. And as a result, they rely on the drag washer systems to, uh, to, to provide that uh, variability in line retrieve while fighting and keeping tension on the fish. Most drag stacks, again, have a, a main gear, it has a cavity in the main gear, it has a series of washers. Usually, uh, this is typical of a pen setup, but typical of many of the setups out there. Usually there's six or seven uh, drag washers involved. There's a, in these case, in this case, these are the older washers, they're leather, so leather dries, gets brittles and cracks, and you lose your, uh, your drag tension. You have metal washers that if you uh, get salt water intrusion, they're going to start pitting on you. And you have, uh, that's called a keyed washer, and then the middle washer always has two little tags on it that's called an eared washer. And the drag system, we'll, we'll talk about that another day, how it actually works, but the consumable pieces and parts are the drag washers, and they do wear over time. So you want to make sure as you're maintaining a reel that you check your drag washers I'm just going to put this back in the way they stack, they alternate. And uh, you want to check your drag washers to make sure that uh, they're well maintained, lubricated. You can use a, uh, a product like uh, Cal's Universal Drag Grease, even though the, the, the uh, label's worn off. They make a drag grease just for that. Or you can just use your general real drag, uh, real grease uh, while you're maintaining a reel. And in this case, for example, that you might be using Penn's Blue Grease. Uh, go ahead and uh, put some on those leather washers there. So on the conventional reels, it's the consumable pieces. It's the drags, uh, the eccentric spring. It's the drag washers. And uh, every now and then you'll get gear wear. I just pulled one here. And you can see there's significant damage here. And uh, that damage uh, occurred over time. I'm not sure what caused it. 
Uh, that's not a one chance. Uh, got snagged on a rock, tried to pull it hard, and stripped all the teeth. That uh, that eroded over time, and it eroded probably in its interaction with the pinion gear, and uh, something got stuck somewhere, and this one just kept getting dragged along until it finally broke all the teeth on it. So when you're doing your, your reel repair on a conventional reel, you want to stop and you want to check all the teeth, make sure that they have good alignment, that they're not chipped, cracked, or broken, and you want to do that on both sides. You want to do it on the pinion gear and on the main gear. So I'm going to leave you with one other thing that's uh, good to know about reels, and that's retrieve rate. And you'll find this is different in all types of reels. And uh, you're going to get a low retrieve if you have a relatively small main gear and a relatively large pinion gear. That's because the travel around the gear, number of times on this one, one, to number of times around the pinion gear, maybe two or three, you're going to three to one ratio on a gearing system like this. If you have a bigger gear and a smaller pinion gear, it's going to take more turns for that small gear to make a revolution of one for the big gear, and that's going to result in a, um, a ratio probably of four or five or six or even some of the higher speed ones now probably getting up to seven to one uh, in those ratios. So uh, that's, uh, that's the common failure points other than screws that fall out, line that gets trapped in reels, frame twist from uh, having a loose frame, uh, or obvious damage from uh, dropping the reel or um, slamming it against a pier rail or a gun wall or something like that. The obvious issues are in the expendables, the ones that you would expect to see go, like the springs and the drag washers, and uh, all of that can generally be avoided by simply uh, tuning your reels up on an annual basis, making sure that things like your drag washers are, are lubricated, cleaning out the dirt inside the reel, and um, taking care to make sure that the side plates are clean, the line is changed. You'll notice I don't have line on any of these reels. Line does deteriorate, so, so take care of that by cleaning out the, the lines, and um, that will keep you uh, fishing for a long time to come. Okay, so let's turn our attention then to the variant on the, uh, uh, the straight conventional reel, and that would be the level wind reel. And this has gained popularity over time, and, and probably the most popular of the selling reels these days uh, contain a level wind feature in it. So this one happens to be a Shakespeare Wonder Reel. This one was made in 1940, and we know that because their model codes used to uh, indicate the years that the uh, reels were made. So this is a model GA, and G stood for 40, uh, for 4 as the first number, and A stood for 0. So the Model GA was a 1940 pre-war pre reel. The reason I selected Shakespeare is Shakespeare was the one that had the patent on the level wind uh, feature, and it goes all the way back to the early 1900s. And actually, Shakespeare designed his reel because he was up in Boston one day, and he was at a manufacturing plant that made thread. And he noticed that the way that they put thread onto a bobbin involved a mechanism similar to this. So he voted to, to incorporate the uh, level wind into a fishing reel, much like we saw earlier with the Meisselback reel. And uh, it's been a popular feature ever since. So that feature is over 100 years old, and it has evolved over time. So it's come from a, uh, an early uh, reel that had a metal frame, single side drive. Uh, it's moved up in the world to something like the the 70s and the 80s with the pen. This happens to be a pen model 10, but not much has changed. You have a worm drive, you have a line guide, you have a, in this case, they've added a drag to it. Uh, they've used plastic rather than metal sides, but for the most part, the, the features and functions are the same. We've had the ever popular uh, and always present, it seemed, uh, Ambassador. That's been around forever in the manufacturing and design of this reel, although internally, has changed over time. There's four or five different uh, types of uh, internals. The exterior is very much the same. This one featuring metal side plates, this one being made in, in uh, Sweden. And then this is a, uh, a left-handed version of a Shimano Calcutta. And this is kind of where the, the, uh, the reels are today in a level line feature. Single frame, 
or solid frames to them for the most part, either plastic or metal. In this case, it's a metal frame. Uh, again, with a, uh, a line guide featuring a, a worm drive and, uh, and a pole, which is exactly what was happening in this case in 1940, but since his patent date all the way back in the 1900s. So what does that reel look like on the inside? Well, let's, uh, let's take a quick look at the mechanics behind the Ambassador. I chose that because it's a very popular reel. And what you'll find is a couple of uh, items here. If you look underneath here, you have a transition gear called an idler gear. And it's either a single uh, tooth outside or a, uh, it has two pieces to that gear. And it's made of plastic. The plastic drives a gear on what's known as a, a, a worm gear. And that can either be attached or it can be a separate piece. In the pen reels, it's a separate piece uh, that, uh, that rinds it. But at any rate, it's a snake-like or an X-like feature in there. And as it turns, it drives a line guide. And a pawl. The little pawl is a forked piece that fits in the line guide and that travels in the slot. So that little guy is going to travel in the slot as it turns and when it gets over to a corner it's actually going to be turned backwards by the gear itself and, and I don't know if you can see it. I can see it. It's a little tough but it turns and runs back the course the other way. So uh, those are the, the core parts. And uh, I just took an exploded view here. This is off of a Pen Pier 209 reel, but you'll see in this case it also has that plastic transition reel or transition gear. And, I, and if we want to talk about the failure points on these reels, there's really a couple of failure points and they all have to do with the weakest link in the chain. So this is not the right gear, although it will turn it, but this is kind of what it looks like in terms of the spool, turning the idler gear, turning the worm gear to turn the worm drive, and, and so on. And what happens is, this is the gear that nine times out of ten is going to be the failure point in a level wind reel. The reason for that is it's plastic, not metal, but there's a reason why it's plastic. There's got to be some give in the reel based on the way the travel of the, uh, the worm gears but more importantly, when a reel gets hung up, you don't want to trash the whole reel. If this was metal, you would have, uh, and you're trying to lurch that out of a rock, what's going to happen is the, this gear is going to bind this, and it's going to break a lot of different pieces. So the, the developers generally went with, let's go with a plastic gear, and uh, if anything you know, gives in terms of a snag or a break, that uh, that's going to be the gear that's going to chip and by the way they're inexpensive and you'd rather replace one piece than going ahead and replacing the whole assembly. So what are the failure points on a level wind reel? It's the, the gears that drive the worm gear. You can get, if let's say that didn't budge, you can get wear in the teeth here that that pawl is, is traveling on and the, uh, a lot of times what will happen is that pawl will get here, get a snag, has nowhere to go and it starts rupturing the alleyways that it travels in and uh, then it just gets uh, to the point where it can't work any longer. So you, you have the failure points being the, the plastic gear, the worm gear, the worm drive, and the pawl itself. So that pawl has uh, two points on it. They can wear, they can chip, they can break, and when one or the other side wears too much, it can't make the turnaround. So we have a lot of times where I will get a reel into the shop that says uh, my, my line guide is stuck all the way on the left or the right. And that's usually because one of the points of the pole has broken off. So those are the, the working parts of the uh, line drive reel. A lot of these reels, like this one, have a free spool release that you press down and then after you're, you're lining out, trip it and it comes back up. That's the main failure point of, uh, of a reel of this design. I apologize, this one's dirty, but I just grabbed this one. This is an earlier design for the Ambassador, but they're all essentially the same. You press down on this lever. Let's see if I can do this without losing something. That's going to push this fork underneath. I'll take the gearing off. You'll see that the forking goes underneath. 
When that fork goes underneath, turning this gear will trip that fork to push it back up. And that's how it comes out. But while it's in there, it's going to allow the, it's going to pull the pinion gear out to disengage from the spool. It's going to allow the spool to turn. And as soon as you turn that piece, it's going to re-engage this and it's going to clear that mechanism back up. Last point on a reel like this, many of us become familiar with the anti-reverse dog, which is actually a fork. You'll see that it's two sides, it rides on a click ratchet, and the click ratchet goes in between that fork. So what will happen on reels like this is over time that fork will spread and not grab the, the click ratchet to pull it in, and then maybe we can demonstrate by pulling this off. It's a little bit ahead of schedule here, but I guess we can't. I guess I have that shield on there. Okay, so this is your click ratchet. This is your anti-reverse. It's going to be uh, hanging on there. Notice that it's, uh, it's got two sides to it. You want to get the side, each side, with the click ratchet in the middle. There's a screwdriver for this. spread those tines. There we go. We're in on that now, so you have one tine on each side. As you're cranking, it's going to push the anti-reverse out so that it allows the reel to spin, and as soon as you backpedal, it pulls that dog in so that it can't retreat. So I'll just show it to you one more time there. Well, as you can imagine, if those forks get on the wrong side, if those forks become um, uh, spread too wide that they can't grip, or if those forks separate and are broken, that anti-reverse won't operate. So what are the failure points on this? This is a good example of the reel because I got a heavy amount of grease and it's old grease in here. That click ratchet will not slide easily if it has dried grease and eventually it won't engage with the, the spokes underneath here to trip the reel. You have springs that can break, but rarely. You have an anti-reverse dog with that uh, that forked type assembly, which wears over time, and uh, eventually you're going to have to replace the drag washers. If you want to say what's a weak point of these types of reels, it's a limited drag capacity on these particular reels. But uh, that's the, uh, the mechanics of how a level line reel works from the earliest inceptions to the latest uh, versions of those level lines. And if you take a look at the low profile bait caster like the Revo here, it's all the same. Uh, the the anti-reverses have changed to an instant anti-reverse clutch in this, but essentially it's all the same underneath. They're going to have a trip mechanism that's going to re release the uh, free spool. Uh, it release in free spool is going to release the uh, pinion gear. It's going to allow you to, to spool out and cast and then when you click the mechanism it's going to reset this. So dirt, grease, wear, wear on the drag washers, wear on the anti-reverse dog, dirt and grease to, to, to uh, clog this mechanism. So if you have a bait caster, uh, any of them, if you have a bait caster like this where it goes down but it doesn't come back up, it's dried grease. Best way to do that is just take a penetrating oil, spray it around the reel, like that, let it sit for a while, go get a cup of coffee or something, come on back and chances are you will have an assembly that can be worked free. Uh, so uh, that, that kind of is the highlights of what fails on level wine reels. Uh, kind of um, exhibit A or, or sub-segment A to what fails on conventional reels. The rest of that is, is things we had talked about, general wear and tear on uh, the free spool release mechanism the drag washers, and in this case we now know the pole, the level wind, the worm gear, and the plastic uh, transition idler gear uh, are all failure points there. So I hope that, uh, that this is being informative and educational, and we'll move on to the next one uh, which is ever popular, and that is the spinning wheel. So before we begin the segment on spinning reels, I thought that we would just take a moment and talk about reel repair. And uh, this one doesn't come with the disclaimer, don't try any of this stuff at home. And actually that's why uh, I formed my YouTube channel to show everybody how to do it at home. Because it's not that hard to do, but you do need a plan. 
And the plan generally uh, comes in the form of thinking about what you want to do with the reel and then go and get some information prior to your start. So here's uh, one of the recommendations that I have. It's always to pull a schematic for the reel. And they're available out on the internet. There's plenty of places you can find it. This one is for the Shimano Stratic. And uh, I believe I got that one at Mike's Reel Repair. Uh, that's certainly a place. You can actually go to the Shimano website or Daiwa website or uh, penparts.com, which is now Mystic Parts. Uh, just go do an internet search for your reel, your model, and a schematic uh, diagram, and generally you can pick that up. That'll tell you what to expect inside the reel as you go on to repair the reel. I also encourage you to take pictures along the way. I take pictures by videos, but uh, you don't have to. You can use a cell phone camera or uh, just a general digital camera or the like. Uh, at critical junctures as you're removing parts just so you can keep track of that. And as you'll see, spinning reels are probably uh, uh, as simple as that earliest reel that uh, we had shown here. Uh, not a lot of moving parts, but you do need to know what it is that you're getting into. So let's talk about spinning reels then. Spinning reels actually had their introduction pre-war. Pre-war being pre-World War II. I guess that kind of indicates what age I am. And most of them were done in Europe. There, as far as I'm aware, there's not a uh, indication of U.S. made ones before the real, uh, before World War II. And the GIs came back from the war and they, uh, uh, they either brought back uh, reels made in Europe or they brought back the ideas which became uh, popular here. So this actually is a reel that I started fishing with uh, all those years ago back in the 50s. This is a, a Centura Pacific. It was made in France. And uh, this is not the reel. This is one that I bought to remind me that this is the reel that I fished with. I kind of tore the heck out of mine. Half bale. Half bale had a patent. The full bale had a patent on it that didn't expire until 1954. I believe it was called the Hardy patent. Uh, so most of the manufacturers made the half bale until that patent expired, at which point they could uh, uh, do it themselves. So this one is an example of a, an early French reel. Of course, everybody grew up at that time fishing with a Mitchell 300. Uh, that was one of the earliest. You had the 300 and you had the, uh, the, the 304 and the 324 and they became po very popular. This is a reel also from Europe at the time, the half bale. This is actually a, uh, a record. It was made in Switzerland. This has got a rear drag. So there were two popular types of drags. There were the top end drags, uh, like this reel, and there were the rear drags. The idea with the rear drag being you didn't have to reach over your line to, uh, to provide the tension on the drag to, uh, to fight a fish. So lots of examples uh, of European reels uh, Dam, uh, the Deutsche uh, Manufacturing in uh, Berlin made a reel, made lots of reels. And uh, that was typical of what happened in the early 50s. And then manufacturers switched in the 60s. Penn introduced their Spin Fisher line. I think this is this, uh, the 704 Greenie. But uh, they came out with the, um, the Spin Fisher in 1961. And then uh, reels started moving to Japanese production. You had, uh, this is a Daiwa reel. I think this is the GS30, kind of, it's a project that needs to be done, but uh, came up in the, uh, in the 1950s. And interestingly enough, post-war Japan was making reels for uh, a lot of the US department stores and the like. And Daiwa had a lot of uh, trade names like King Neptune and the like where they made reels for Sears, Roebuck, and Montgomery Wards and places like that. And then they started marketing their own reels a little bit later. And then, of course, our favorite uh, bicycle manufacturer, uh, Shimano, got in the game in the 19, uh, I believe it was the 1970s. Uh, and they started making uh, fishing reels, uh, and they still continue to this day. So what, uh, what's inside of a uh, spinning reel these days? Is, is pretty much stock. There's some variations. Uh, the Shimano Stratic is a variation, but what I'll do is I'm just gonna use an example. This happens to be a Shakespeare reel. 
and a lot of things have changed. The, the types of side plates have changed from metal to graphite uh, or plastic. In this case, it's probably plastic. Uh, spools have uh, either gone composite or uh, metal. Uh, the drags have been improved. They now have carbon drag washers in there uh, or HD100s. Uh, some of the weaknesses of the earlier systems like um, case fractures have been uh, uh, They've added bump guards to kind of uh, fix that. They've made it a fashion industry in my mind. That's that they've prettied up the reels, but once you take a reel open inside, uh, very much the same structure in a reel today as it was in the 1970s for the most part. And this will this will indicate it. So I'm going to show you how uh, to service a spinning reel and uh, how to what makes the reel work. So uh, I've removed the side plate screws just uh, to make it easier for the video in terms of timing. You don't need to watch me do that. Uh, and then what you'll find is big gear drives little gear. Uh, all going all the way back to the, the earlier theme. Big gear drives little gear. Uh, pinion gear goes up. Uh, and that's what causes the rotor to rotate, uh, appropriately named rotate. And that's going to drive what would be a bale to wind the uh, line on a fixed spool. So um, let's just show you what the typical components are of a spinning wheel so that you know how to service that. There's a main gear, a pinion gear, a crosswind block, and a crosswind gear. And those things have been pretty much standard for the last 40 years or so in terms of what most reels uh, incorporate underneath. The sizes are different. Uh, you'll see modern day manufacturers or or telling you the space age, there you go, my age again, uh, metals and metallurgy that go into the reels. You got digicut gears, CNC type cut gears. You got fancy uh, components in terms of alloys for the, uh, the, the gears themselves, but the technology in terms of how they line and wind are pretty much the same. If you remove the screw from the crosswind block, you can pull that whole axle shaft up, which is the, the upper end of the block. You can remove the main gear. You'll see that on the back of most main gears, you have the, the big teeth that are driving the pinion gear and the smaller gear, which is driving the crosswind block, which makes the axle shaft go up and down. And depending on the type of reel you have, you will either get bushings or bearings. The lower end reels will incorporate uh, bushings, the higher end reels will incorporate uh, bearings, and uh, they're off to the races in terms of bearing counts these days. How many bearings can you put in a reel is kind of like how many uh, angels can you fit on the head of a pin type of a description there. There's just uh, uh, a lot of bearings going into reels, and folks ask me what's the optimal number, I said three, one on each side of your main gear and one up top on your pinion gear will get it done. Uh, anything other than that is, is typically just frills. Um, not that it doesn't make it easier, it does. Does it uh, improve the wear of a reel? Yeah, probably. But for the most part, I think anything more than, than three is, is uh, limiting your return on investment there, uh, and so on. So that shows you the underneath side, big, big gear drives little gear. Crosswind gear makes the axle shaft go up and down. One more set, I'm going to remove the rotor here. Sometimes you have to remove the rotor to remove the side plate. Uh, depending on the type of reel that you have, this reel does not require that. So we'll just show you up, up top here underneath that, uh, that rotor. And up top on a rotor, in this case it has an old style anti-reverse, which is driven by an eccentric spring. The newer ones will have a, um, uh, an anti-reverse bearing up here or a clutch that'll do the work of this. This one's just running on a spring. If you remember back to the, um, the thing I was doing with the um, Ambassador, not much different in terms of technology. All right, I'm just going to pull this off to show you that there is a bearing under here. So we have one bearing in this, and if you're servicing a reel, you're going to remove that. that uh, that bearing and you're going to clean that up and service it. So what are the common failure points on these reels? Well, the common failure points on these reels are in transition, uh, these 
teeth on the back end of the main gear and how it intersects with the crosswind gear will strip the teeth on that if you're under snag and if you're trying to power out that's the first ones that are going to go the teeth on the crosswind gear and the teeth on the back of the main gear you will uh, if you don't uh, maintain your reels uh, and this gets dry uh, the sluggishness of a reel will uh, come into play but uh, overall if you do an annual service on this you shouldn't wind up with a sluggish reel you can see here that the axle shaft rides through and connects up top to the main gear when that axle shaft is fully exposed I'm just going to show it here without the rotor on if you're on the top end of your stroke like that and you have that axle gear sitting outside of the main gear and you're snagged there will be torsion that will bend this axle shaft and that's a common failure point on spinning wheels so broken teeth lack of lubrication bent axle shaft and then the consumables the drag washers underneath right, the drag washers are housed inside of the spool assembly and those will wear with use because that's what's going to hold this reel on and the more tension you put on there and the types of fish that you have and the type of drag washer that's in there is what's going to cause that. Finally, yeah, we use this as an illustration but this is the other point that fails on spinning reels. The bail wire, and we can kind of show it on this reel. That bail wire tends to bend if it gets hit into a post or it gets uh, whacked against the gun wall or dropped. That tends to, to go. And the only time I see bail springs fail is when somebody actually opens up a reel. Here's an example of one that, uh, this is why I picked this reel, it actually has the bail spring in here. This one is one type of a bail spring that it has. You'll notice that uh, that spring moves up and down as you set the bail. And uh, over time, just like that eccentric spring in the, uh, uh, the pen reel that I showed you, the Jig Master, over time that will uh, wear down and break eventually. And then there's another one, there's a coil spring that's used in some bale assemblies. That coil spring doesn't break, but there's a foot that intersects with the bale arm up here. Usually it's only plastic or uh, uh, cheap metal, and over time either the bale arm will wear or the, uh, the, the foot will wear as a result of it moving in and out of that, uh, that assembly. So if you're working on spinning reels, know that uh, the technology really hasn't changed that much over time. You may incur more ball bearings or less ball bearings depending on the type of reel that you're working on. The keys to maintaining these is to keep these well lubricated, whether they're bearings or they're a bushing uh, subset of the system. And that if you do find a failure, typically it's going to be in broken teeth or uh, abused parts like a broken uh, uh, spring on this anti-reverse system or dirt which causes uh, anti-reverse clutches to fail. So uh, in a nutshell, spinning wheels are very simple. They look a lot different. They have a lot of different characteristics behind them, but at the end of the day, whether it's this type of reel or a reel that uses a, a rear drag system to put the tension on the uh, axle shaft to hold it, either way, the mechanics inside of it are very much the same and the failure points are very similar. So I hope that uh, that's been informative. I hope this whole series has been informative. And uh, I wish you uh, the best and I encourage you to take your reels apart, to, uh, to go do the minimum service on that and uh, to uh, enjoy fishing with them and uh, to ensure that they don't break uh, at points in the future uh, due to lack of maintenance. So I thought I would finish our segments here on common types of reels and reel failures uh, and how to service reels by going full circle. I'm going to end the series with the lever drag. And lever drag to me is as simple as the uh, earliest ones that we saw when we were talking about the conventional reels, uh, the early bait casters, in this case the Meisselback, which was the, uh, the three speed reel and we talked about a big gear driving a little gear driving a spool and that is the essence of a lever drag reel. We talked about improvements in over time where they added, added drag washers, they added a level wind feature, 
Uh, they, they did some other things in terms of changing cases and the like. But at the end of the day, uh, this is the simplest form of the reel. And I believe this is a simple, a simple form of that uh, reel as an extension. And that's an appropriate way to come full circle in the, uh, in the conversation. So we, we went from the, uh, the conventional reels to the spinning reels. Now we're back on the lever drag reel. And whether it's those monsters, uh, this one is a Shimano Triton Beastmaster to speed. Uh, you'll see this uh, obviously heavy uh, tie downs and everything. Uh, used for very big fish, sharking, used for big tuna and the like. Uh, today's reel, the comparable, this happens to be a Poseidon, but you'll be familiar with uh, Vets and Canyons and other brands. Uh, small frame, you don't need the heavy line of those uh, that's on that Beastmaster there. You have a braid that's capable of having that same strength in a compact format and uh, that lever. And here's one from the... Uh, the 1990s. This is uh, partially disassembled so I can show you the inside, but this is the Pen uh, 25 GLS or graphite uh, level senator. And uh, this one was the 1990s, and the lever drag technology is, is not new. Uh, the first international reel that Pen introduced with a lever drag on it was back in the 1960s. So it's been around quite some time. It's been adapted over time, and it's become very popular now. And uh, when we talk about common reel failures, there are very few of them. So let's uh, just talk a little bit about the technology itself. Uh, they all have a main gear uh, that's the handle-driven piece, much like everything else that we've seen in this series. We have a lever, and we have a preset on that lever. And that lever acts to compress a pressure plate that's usually embedded inside the spool that's going to apply pressure to the drag washer which is inside the spool and that's going to determine how free or uh, how tight that drag is uh, in its uh, hold as, as you are fishing. So I'll take this apart just to give you a peek inside. We'll talk a little bit about it and We'll talk a little bit about the common failure. So I, as, I, as I mentioned, it kind of looked like this. There was a trim ring and there was the uh, uh, presets and there was the, the lever itself and the like and the handle attached. But of course, for the sake of time, we've taken that off. I've just left the one screw in at this point. So when you remove the uh, side plate from the lever uh, drag reel, uh, there's, there's some springs in here usually on the pressure plate that will uh, put some tension on that side plate. So just be aware of that if you are taking that off. You also need to remove the lever assembly. There's a spring there. As you see. That's the preset. And then the lever will come off. And you'll notice on the lever drag reels, this is pretty common on all of them, there's some kind of a ramp system. So in this case, we have two triangles or pyramids. And uh, they're spaced apart from each other. And you have a corresponding uh, recess in the back of the handle. And as you move the handle, you ride up the ramp. And up the ramp is putting pressure on the pressure plate that's inside here, pulling it or pushing it, depending on the setup. And uh, that's what's going to engage the drag wheel. All right, so I'm also taking this one apart because it needs a little bit of service. We'll be interested to find out what's underneath here. But uh, as you open this one up, this is a single speed. It only has one drive. And you'll notice you have a, uh, a drive gear. You'll, you have a bearing in this case behind it. You have an anti-reverse dog set up underneath here. I'm not going to disturb that at the moment. But to service this, you would simply push your main gear through. And uh, actually, in this case, you're going to remove it by taking the screw off, pulling the, the main gear out, and pushing the assembly that way. But uh, at any rate, the main gear gets serviced. You can hear the anti-reverse in the background working there. This all gets cleaned up and uh, worked on there. But more importantly, I wanted to show you those transition pieces here. As you'll notice, the frame has nothing going on in it. It's got a little click mechanism here, but other than that, it's kind of a dead-end frame, and that's tr traditional of almost all lever drags. Here's your big gear drives the little gear. This is the little gear. That's your, uh, your pinion gear. Uh, Having another look at it from this side, it's going to ride that way. So you're turning the main gear, and that little gear, which hooks into the pressure plate here, is turning the spool. Now this one, is, interestingly enough, has a tab assembly on it, 
Some of these are screwed down, some of these screw in. There's different ways that they put collars on them. But generally speaking, if you see a T, there you go, it just popped right out. Uh, that's all it's holding that on. You then have a pressure plate. Your pressure plate typically has a bearing inside of it. Sometimes it'll have a bearing on both sides of it, but because of the way that the pinion gear is loaded on this side, uh, in this particular reel, that's not going to happen. But you have a bearing here. And then you have one well-worn drag on this one. And some of these drags, like the Yvette's, are glued into the uh, spool. And some of these drags, I think this one probably is independent of that. I'm not going to play around with it now. I'm sure it's independent of that because I remember the setup now. Uh, those would need to be replaced with uh, a new new one. So what's the, uh, the common failure points on this? This is a, a fixed axle. There's a bearing on this side. There's a bearing in here. There's a bearing on the pressure plate. There's a bearing inside. So at least four uh, ball bearings on this one. What's the common failure points? That's it right there. It's the, uh, the drag will either get dirty, and I can't tell if this is dirt or if this is wear. I guess I could by simply brushing. And most of that is dirt, interestingly enough. So if you have a situation like this, all you want to do is apply soapy water and a bristle brush like this, and you can clear off a lot of that stuff that got trapped in there. That, that dry washer will clean up. Sometimes you get, uh, if you get sand in there, you're going to wear the, the drag and you're going to wear the pressure plate. It's almost like a clutch plate on an automobile if you're uh, familiar with that technology. Uh, and then failed burrings. Uh, that's what happens on, uh, on these reels because those are your pressure points. You, your drag washer, your drag plate, and the burrings are about the only thing that uh, goes wrong with these. Uh, of course, if you get lime inside of it, if you get some other debris, uh, something like that, you can chew up teeth. But most of these are very heavy-duty teeth. This one looks like it's stainless teeth, and uh, those things are going to go a long, long time. So, uh, as I mentioned, we kind of came full circle, right? It was big gear turns little gear turns spool. That's what we have here. Big gear turns little gear turns spool. In this case, you'll see how that pressure plate uh, works in terms of it comes up the ramp, it pushes that in. When it pushes that in, it engages with the drag, and that's where you get the pressure. And that's common, a common setup regardless of manufacturer or uh, type of uh, lever drag reel that you have. So uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this overview, and uh, I hope that it's been informative, and I hope you've learned a little bit about what uh, the common failure points are on the various types of reels that we discussed. So thank you for watching. This is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle. There's something about the water that'll give you peace All by yourself or with your family Live so strong and wet